Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Precision Medicine, Using Genotype to Inform Prescribing, presented by Dr. Larissa Cavallari, an associate professor and the director at the Center for Pharmacogenetics, University of Florida College of Pharmacy. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen and type the questions into the drop down box that appears on your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the help desk button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen or use that ask a question box and let us know you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing educational credits. Please click on the accreditation button located on the promotional board at the bottom center of your screen and follow the process to obtain those credits. Without further ado, join me in introducing and presenting our speaker today, Dr. Larissa Cavallari. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Dr. Cavallari. Thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to present. Um, I'm happy today to talk about precision medicine. I have been doing research in the area of precision medicine and specifically looking at genes that are associated with drug response for over 15 years. And then since 2012, we've started implementing these discoveries into practice. And so what I'll be sharing today is our experience from UF Health with precision medicine. So if you'll recall from his State of the Union address in 2015, former President Obama appeared with his DNA double helix, and this was all really exciting for those of us who are in this area of genomic medicine. He announced his Precision Medicine Initiative, which is to use genetic approaches to better treat and um, understand disease. And he specifically said, I want the country that eliminated polio and mapped the human genome to lead a new era of medicine one that delivers the right drug or the right treatment at the right time. And this essentially signaled continued government support of genomic medicine, which started essentially in, the in 1990 with the Human Genome Project. Precision medicine involves the use of patient-specific information, including family history, medical history, and environmental factors like diet, in addition to genetic information and other unique information to personalize and individualize care. Precision medicine really encompasses looking at predictors of disease risk and assisting with disease diagnosis, as well as assisting with uh, drug treatment based on, based on patient-specific factors. And here, that really encompasses both cancer genetics, where various institutions are sequencing the tumor tissue, and then based on the variants that are um, identified, choosing the best chemotherapy for the patient. And then pharmacogenetics, which is the, what I'll be talking about today, is the um, association between germline variants and response to drug therapy. So genes in terms of drug response really affect drug response by either influencing the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics of a drug. So in the case of pharmacodynamics, the genotype can influence the sensitivity to a drug, and this can affect how beneficial the drug is or how effective the drug is, in addition to risk for adverse drug effects. In terms of pharmacodynamics, the genotype can help influence how the drug is distributed throughout the body and eliminated from the body, and this can help define the dose that is needed for an optimal effect um, or to minimize risk of having an adverse effect. And what I'll be predominantly focusing on are, is the pharmacogenetics around the metabolism of drugs. This is what's been most clinically implemented into practice. In terms of how the gene might affect drug response, it really depends on two main factors. One is if the drug is given in its active form and has to be inactivated by the body, and or it can be administered as a prodrug where it has no activity in, in its administered form, but then the body transforms it to the active drug. 
And then response or the effect of genotype also depends on whether the gene leads to increased metabolism or to decreased or no metabolism of the drug. So for example, if you have an active drug and a genotype associated with increased metabolism, then you could rapidly metabolize that drug to its inactive form and the drug may not be effective in usual doses. On the other hand, if you give an active drug or a drug in its active form and you have the genotype associated with decreased to no metabolism, then you can develop super therapeutic concentrations of the active drug and be at risk for adverse drug effects. And then at the opposite extreme, if you give a drug as a prodrug, and there are a number of drugs, including a couple we'll talk about today, that are administered as prodrugs, and they have to be activated within the body to the active uh, form that then produces the pharmacologic effects. And in this case, if you have increased metabolism, then you can rapidly convert the drug to its active form, and this can lead to super therapeutic plasma concentrations of the drug and increased risk for adverse effects. If you have a genotype associated with decreased or no metabolism, then you cannot activate the drug or you, or you activate it just a little bit, and this could lead to decreased drug effectiveness. So we currently have over 150 drugs that have genetic information in their FDA approved labeling. And these drugs really span multiple diseases. In some cases, they're drugs to treat cardiovascular disease like Coumadin or Clopidogrel. Um, in other cases, these are drugs for neurologic disorders like Tegretol, for infectious disease such as a back of ear for HIV. There are cancer drugs like Mercaptopurine. Um, and then also drugs for cystic fibrosis and pain management and others. So it really expands multiple disease states in terms of the, the medications that have genetic information in their labeling. And where this genetic information can appear also varies among different drug products. So for some drugs, the genetic information is in this box warning set section of the label, which is the most serious section of the label or a serious kind of warning. Um, I show here with Tegretol, there is a variant in the HLA-B gene that increases risk for serious cutaneous reactions from the drug, mainly Stevens-Johnson syndrome or toxic epidermal necrolysis. And these variants in HLA-B are more common in individuals from certain Asian countries. And so the box warning sets basically states that patients with ancestry and genetically at-risk populations should be screened for the presence of this HLA-B variant and if they test positive, then Tegretol should be avoided or only used if the benefit clearly outweighs the risk. For other drugs, like for Coumadin, or also called Warfarin, um, or thiopurines, this information is in the dosage and administration section of the label. So shown here is a dosing table in the Warfarin labeling. The BCOR C1 genotype, which codes for the target protein, is on the left-hand column, and then the CYP2C9 genotype, which metabolizes the drug, is across the top. So if you look at the BCOR C1 GG genotype, which is the less sensitive genotype in normal metabolism, which is designated as STAR1, STAR1, then the recommendation is to start 5 to 7 milligrams per day with lower doses used in older individuals or those of smaller body size. And then at opposite extreme, if you have an individual with the AA genotype, the highly sensitive genotype, and decreased metabolism, then they may need a dose as little as 0.5 to 2 milligrams a day to reach therapeutic anticoagulation. So here at UF Health and many other institutions across the country, we really rely on guidelines by CPIC to let us know which gene drug pairs are ready for clinical implementation. So CPIC stands for Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, and it was formed back in 2009 as a collaboration between the Pharmacogenetics Research Network and the Pharmacogenetics Knowledge Base. And it was recognized that one of the major barriers to implementing pharmacogenetics in practice is there, aren't, there isn't much guidance on how to use that information to optimize therapy. And so this is what CPIC is designed to address. They, the guidelines do not say whether or not you should order a ge genetic test. This is left to the discretion of the provider, but rather if you have genetic results available, how they should be used to optimize drug therapy. The CPIC guidelines are available for drugs that have the strongest genetic associations with response. And it, for the most part of all of the implementations at UF Health, which are shown on this slide, they have CPIC guidelines that are available. The exception is CYP2C19, 
for proton pump inhibitors. And in this case, we do not yet have CEPA guidelines. We felt that the data were strong enough to support using genotype to dose these drugs. And actually, we're now on a writing committee for a CPIT guideline focused on PPIs. So those will be coming out probably within the next year. We launched our program here in 2012. The first genotype that we started um, genotyping our patients for was cytochrome P450 2C19, or CYP 2C19, which is involved in the bioactivation of clopidogrel. We have since expanded our uh, testing to our Jacksonville campus in 2016, where we also test for CYP2C19 to determine response to clopidogrel. And then we've also implemented testing to determine response to other drugs, such as thiopurines, which are used for pediatric cancers, as well as some GI and other disorders, um, opioids for pain, PEG interferon alpha for hepatitis C, we genotype for two variants to help with term determining selection and dosing of serotonin, selective serotonin um, reuptake inhibitors used for depression, and we predominantly use this in our pediatric um, psychiatry clinic here. And then most recently with CYP2C19 testing to help with PPI dosing. So notably in 2013, we were awarded funding as part of the IGNITE network. This is funded through NHGRI, the National Institutes of Genome Research, or the uh, Genome Research Institute, and um, IGNITE stands for Implementing Genomics in Practice. And the goal of that is really to move all these genetic discoveries to patient care. So we got this funding in 2013, and it's largely helped support the implementations we've done since then. So as I mentioned, the first drug that we started with was clopidogrel. Um, this is a drug that is um, used very commonly for patients who have had an acute coronary syndrome or heart attack or have undergone percutaneous coronary intervention or angioplasty. And the drug helps keep the platelets from sticking together and by preventing this platelet aggregation, it can decrease risk of having a recurrent heart attack or stroke as well as um, preventing thrombosis of any stent that might be placed in the coronary artery. So this is a prodrug, has no activity on its own. It must be metabolized to its active form, and CYP2C19 has a major role in that bioactivation. So to, so to show that more clearly, this is a figure from the pharmacogenetics knowledge base, so it's freely available. Just go to farmgkb.org, and this shows that once clopidogrel enters the body and it reaches the liver, then the majority of the drug is metabolized by carboxyl esterase to an inactive metabolite that is eliminated from the body. And it's only about 15% of the drug that remains. This undergoes a two-step bioactivation process via multiple CYP450 enzymes to its active metabolite that then irreversibly binds to the platelet P2Y12 receptor to prevent platelet activation and aggregation. CYP2C19 is involved in both steps of this bioactivation process, and it's very important for generating the active metabolite. Individuals who inherit a deficiency in the enzyme because of their genotype may have decreased formation of the active metabolite and therefore decreased effectiveness of clopidogrel at inhibiting platelet aggregation. The gene CYP2C19 is highly polymorphic. We use this star allele nomenclature to designate various uh, polymorphisms in the genome. So in the case of CYP2C19, the star 2 and star 3 alleles occur as a result of single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, that either lead to a splicing defect or a stop codon, and essentially to a complete loss of enzyme function. So these are termed either non-functional alleles or loss of function alleles. Star 17, on the other hand, this is a gain of function allele associated with increased function. It is in the promoter region of the gene and it leads to increased gene transcription. And then STAR1 is considered the normal allele. It's really an allele of default. So if you genotype for STAR2, STAR3, and STAR17 and none of these are found, then the patient is designated to have a STAR1 allele. These variants confer five different phenotypes. So patients who have the STAR1, STAR1 genotype, so inherited a copy from both mother and the father of the normal genotype, they are normal metabolizers. 
individuals with a single loss of function allele, like star one, star two, or star one, star three, have a significant reduction in enzyme activity and are intermediate metabolizers. Those with two loss of function alleles, like the star two, star two genotype, are poor metabolizers. They have no active enzyme. And then individuals with one or two star 17 or gain of function variants are either rapid or ultra rapid metabolizers. In the case of clopidogrel, the variants that are most important are star two and star three, which lead to loss of function and the intermediate and poor metabolizer phenotypes. There are racial differences in the prevalence of these phenotypes. Approximately two to 4% of those of European or African ancestry are poor metabolizers with no CYP2C19 enzyme. Another 25 to 30% are intermediate metabolizers with a significant reduction in enzyme activity. And then these are much higher in Asians. In the Asian population, about 60 to 65% of individuals are poor or intermediate metabolizers. There have been a number of studies done, mostly retrospective um, analyses of randomized controlled trial data, or RCTs, or patient registries, and they've shown that among patients receiving clopidogrel, there's an increased risk for adverse cardiovascular events, mostly heart attack or stroke, or stent thrombosis, in those with a loss of, fu loss of function allele compared to those without a loss of function allele. So here, um, this was a meta-analysis shown on this slide of nine trials, nearly 9,700 patients. They were all high-risk patients. Most of them had a heart attack, and almost all of them underwent coronary intervention or angioplasty with stent placement to keep that vessel open. The uh, investigators for this meta-analysis found that the risk for MACE, which stands for Major Adverse Cardiovascular Events, consists of cardiovascular death, heart attacks or stroke was about 1.6 fold greater in those who were treated with clopidogrel and had a loss of function variant versus similar, similarly treated patients without a loss of function variant. And the risk for stent thrombosis was nearly three times greater in those with a loss of function variant. So based on these data, in 2010, the FDA approved a revision of the clopidogrel label. So this is now a box warning in the label, and it states that there's decreased antiplatelet effect of clopidogrel in patients with two loss of function alleles, that tests are available to identify these patients, and that alternative agents should be considered. So since this was this uh, labeling um, started, we now have significant evidence that intermediate metabolizers with a single loss of function allele are also at risk for decreased clopidogrel effectiveness. The CPIC, or Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, has published guidelines for how to use CYP2C19 testing to guide antiplatelet therapy. These are focused on the high-risk patients in whom the data are the strongest. So patients with an acute coronary syndrome, designated here as ACS, that's namely individuals who've had a heart attack and undergo PCI or coronary intervention, also known as angioplasty. In this high-risk patient population, if you have the genotype and the patient has one or two loss of function alleles, so they're an IM or a PM, then the recommendation is to use an alternative drug because clopidogrel is not expected to be effective because you can't bioactivate it. And the alternatives um, that are recommended are either prasugrel or ticagrelor. On the other hand, for normal metabolizers or rapid or ultra rapid metabolizers, clopidogrel is expected to be effective in its standard dose. So we implemented testing for clopidogrel here at, in 2012. We did this as part of routine care, and what that means is that the test was added to the standard order set for patients who have undergone a coronary intervention. And so it's the default test. All of our patients are genotyped unless the physician chooses to deselect that test. The sample is processed for um, genotype in our clinical pathology lab, and the results are placed in the electronic health record. We have a clinical pharmacist who then reviews all the results and for patients who have a loss of function variant, the pharmacist will follow up with the physician to recommend alternative therapy. And I put a citation at the bottom here that describes this in more detail. We also built a best practice advisory in our EPIC electronic health record. 
So what happens is if a physician orders clopidogrel and a patient is known to be a poor or intermediate metabolizer, then this alert will appear. And the alert basically states that the patient's genotype is associated with impaired activation of clopidogrel and increased risk for stent thrombosis after a coronary intervention or other cardiovascular events. We also include recommendations for these patients, so either prescribe prasugrel or ticagrelor. We've also included contraindications to these drugs and any cautions with them to really make the process, this prescribing process very straightforward for the clinician. You see the genotype is actually in smaller print at the bottom um, because in most cases the, cl the clinician doesn't care what the actual genotype is, they just want to know what the implication of having that genotype is. And then from this alert, the, the physician can choose to go ahead and place an order for, for prasugrel or ticagrelor, or if deemed appropriate, they may want to proceed with clopidogrel. This may be a patient who has contraindications to the other drugs. So after the first two years of the program, we looked back to see how many people were genotyped and what the physicians did with the genotype results. So then, did they actually follow the recommendation to start alternative therapy? So in the first two years, we had just over 400 patients who underwent genotyping, and 31% of these had a loss of function allele, which is consistent with the prevalence that I showed earlier. So approximately 2% of patients were poor metabolizers, and 28, 29% were intermediate metabolizers. Of those with a loss of function allele, or an LOF allele, as shown on the slide, then alternative therapy was started in just over half of them. So we basically found that clinical implementation was successful. Um, in most cases, the majority of the time, the, the physician would change therapy in patients with a loss of functional allele, so this was great, but does this really matter clinically? So what we did is we went back to the medical record for all the patients who'd been genotyped, and we looked for hospitalizations for cardiovascular events like heart attacks or strokes, or for the occurrence of death in the six-month period following coronary intervention. And then we compared major adverse cardiovascular events, or MACE, which is defined as heart attack, stroke, death, or stent thrombosis, between those with a loss of function allele treated with clopidogrel, shown in the top red line, those with a loss of function allele treated with alternative therapy, like prasugrel or ticagrelor, shown with the dotted line, and those without a loss of function allele, so the non-LOF group, this is shown by that solid dark line, and most of these patients got clopidogrel. And as you can see, we found there was a much higher risk for MACE in those with a loss of function allele who were treated with clopidogrel versus alternative therapy, and no differences in outcomes between those with a loss of function allele on alternative therapy versus those without a loss of function allele. We also found that most of these events occurred in that first 30 days following coronary intervention, and this has major implications for reimbursement. There's now the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Hospital Reduction, Hospital Readmission Reduction Program, and through that, for individuals who have to be readmitted in the first 30 days, then that would affect the reimbursement for that hospitalization. So these are the data that we show to our administrators to support or to, to gather their continued support of our program. So we thought this was great. We showed this in 400 patients, but it may not make a real, really clinically meaningful impact on the field with a, with a relatively small sample size. So we then went to the IGNITE network, again, that stands for Implementing Genomics in Practice, to see if we could collaborate and um, have a bigger study to look at outcomes with genotype-guided antiplatelet therapy. So this network, the, the goal of it is to advance genomic medicine and patient care, and there are six funded sites. They're shown in the box on the left. Three of those sites are focusing on pharmacogenomics, us at UF, Vanderbilt University, and Indiana University. <clears throat> in addition to these six funded sites, there are also a number of affiliate sites. Um, and what I show here are the sites that are included in the pharmacogenetics working group. I currently run that working group. And among these sites that are included in that, then there are seven that are implementing CYP2C19 testing into practice. And those are shown by, by the red circles here. And so what we did is we went to uh, those sites to see if they wanted to collaborate, and they did. And in each case, they recommended alternative therapy for patients who had a loss of function variant 
However, it was, it was ultimately up to the physician on how they use that information. Um, and then there were no genotype guided recommendations made for those without a loss of function allele. The groups went back and manually abstracted data from the electronic health record on death or hospitalizations for cardiovascular events in the year period following PCI. We also looked at medication use, specifically on which antiplatelet agent was used in the patient at the time of the event or at the time of last follow-up. And the primary outcome was major adverse cardiovascular events consisting of all-cause mortality, non-fatal MI or heart attack, or stroke. There were a total of 1,815 patients who were included across the seven sites. 31.5% had a loss of function allele, which is similar to what we found in our U.S. cohort. And of these, 60.5% were treated with alternative therapy. And in most cases, this was Prasegrel. Of the 68.5% without a loss of function allele, almost all of them received clopidogrel, almost 85%, and alternative therapies were only used in about 15% of patients. So significantly greater use of alternative therapy in those with versus without a loss of function variant. We had very efficient genotyping across sites. The um, median time from PCI to genotype results entered into the medical record was one day. And then the median time to alternative therapy in those with a loss of function variant was also one day. So in terms of results, we saw a significantly greater risk for major adverse cardiovascular events in those with a loss of function variant treated with clopidogrel versus those with a loss of function variant treated with alternative therapy. There was no difference in the risk for MACE among those with a loss of function allele on alternative therapy versus those without a loss of function allele. And again, most of these were on clopidogrel. And then we, when we did um, adjustment, we did propensity scoring to adjust for any differences between groups. And when we did this, there remained a, a significantly greater risk for major adverse cardiovascular events and those with a loss of function variant treated with clopidogrel versus alternative therapy. The hazard ratio was 2.2. And there was no difference in risk for MACE among those with a loss of function allele on alternative therapy versus those without a loss of function variant. And these data were published just this past, past month in the uh, Journal of American College of Cardi Cardiology, um, Cardiovascular Interventions, so JAC-CI. So in summary of, of this one area, we had data across seven institutions, nearly 2,000 patients. We showed that clinical implementation of pharmacogenetic testing was feasible with rapid return of genotype results and institution of alternative therapy in those with a loss of function allele. And then importantly, we showed that this genotype-guided approach to antiplatelet therapy after coronary intervention led to a significant reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. So I want to move on and talk briefly about proton pump inhibitors, which are commonly used for individuals who have GI reflux disease or H. pylori. And in this case, CYP2C19, the same enzyme, metabolizes proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump inhibitors are administered in their active form, so this is opposite of what we saw with clopidogrel, and then they have to be bio, or they have, they are inactivated in the body by the CYP2C19 enzyme. For individuals who have increased metabolism, so for the rapid and ultra-rapid metabolizers, then they will quickly have to activate the drug, and normal doses may not be effective in these individuals. In those who have decreased to no metabolism, then the amount of the active drug will accumulate in the body, and these individuals can be at risk for side effects. Traditionally, we've thought that proton pump inhibitors are relatively benign. Um, they're very widely prescribed. In many cases, they're continued for a long period of time. But in recent years, there have been data that shows that this chronic use of PPIs may increase risk for certain types of infections, um, for bone fracture and also increased risk for kidney disease. So these do not appear to be as benign as we thought. And there's also been an association between having these side effects and higher levels of proton pump inhibitors in the body. So based on this, poor and intermediate metabolizers are gonna have higher levels of proton pump inhibitors, maybe an increased risk for these adverse effects. So we started testing for CYP2C19 
to guide dosing of PPIs in 2017. And at the same time, we, we uh, started a study to look at the effectiveness of this approach. And this was done in conjunction with Nemours Children's Hospital that's located both in Jacksonville and in Orlando. Together, we came up with recommendations for proton pump inhibitor dosing based on phenotype. So for those who are rapid or ultra-rapid metabolizers, so they have a star 17 allele, then the recommendation is to increase the PPI dose by 50 to 100%. So if you'll recall, we, the, for clopidogrel, the recommendations for rapid and ultra-rapid metabolizers are the same as those for normal metabolizers because we don't really have data that rapid and ultra-rapid metabolizers respond much differently than normal metabolizers in terms of clopidogrel. That's not true here with proton pump inhibitors. Um, they may have a decreased response with normal doses, and so our recommendation is to increase the dose in rapid and ultra-rapid metabolizers. For intermediate or poor metabolizers, the recommendation is to reduce the dose by 25 to 50 percent to help prevent these adverse effects. Um, and these data, we've, we've recently completed a small studies both in adults here at UF Health and in children at Nemours, and the preliminary results from these will be presented at the ASCPT meeting, American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics, um, in this March. So the final example that I want to talk about is with CYP2D6 testing and codeine. So CYP2D6 is a very common drug metabolizing enzyme. It metabolizes a number of different drugs, including opiates. In this case, codeine, tramadol, oxycodone, and hydrocodone are metabolized by CYP2D6 to more active analgesics that have much greater affinity for the opioid mu receptor. Um, so that's sort of shown here on, on this picture. Codeine is a prodrug. If you have the genotype associated with increased metabolism, in this case, it's up to 5% of the population. Then you can get an increased concentration of the active metabolite, which for codeine is morphine. And if you have high morphine concentrations, this can lead to an increased risk for adverse effects, namely respiratory depression and even death. About 10% of the population has either um, no active enzyme at all or significant reduction in enzyme activity. And these individuals, they, they have either can't bioactivate codeine or have very little bioactivation of codeine, so have very low levels of morphine in the body, and they may not get adequate analgesic effects from codeine. And we have similar data to show the same thing is true with tramadol and probably true to some extent with hydrocodone and oxycodone, although the data are less clear for these drugs. CYP2D6 is also important for metabolizing antidepressants, including SSRIs and tricyclic antidepressants. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we use CYP2D6 testing to help guide selection of SSRIs, mostly in our pediatric psychiatry patients. So there have been a number of case reports for individuals who were exposed to codeine and had either severe respiratory depression or even death because of the ultra rapid metabolizer phenotype. So these are two case reports I show here. One was a two-year-old boy. He was prescribed codeine with Tylenol after an adenotonsillectomy. He was otherwise healthy, and he died two days after surgery. On autopsy, they found that he had the CYP2D6 ultra rapid metabolizer phenotype and toxic morphine concentrations in his blood. The other case was a healthy male infant who was being breastfed, and he was found dead on day 12. On autopsy, they found that his concentrations of morphine were in the toxic range. His mother was taking codeine postpartum, and she had the ultra rapid metabolizer phenotype. So in this case, she com rapidly converted codeine to morphine. Toxic morphine levels were then transferred to the infant being breastfed by, through breastfeeding, um, and then this led to, to death in this particular patient. So very serious adverse effects. And in response to this, the FDA has issued a warning basically restricting the use of codeine as well as tramadol. So there's similar data with tramadol. Um, restricted the use of these in any children under the age of 12, and they also should not be used in women who are breastfeeding. There are CPIC guidelines for CYP2D6 and codeine. These were published in 2014, and, and one thing I did not mention earlier, all of these CPIC guidelines are freely available on the web. You can either just Google the CPIC, or you can go to the Pharmacogenomics Knowledge Base website, which is farmgkb.org, and you can get these, these guidelines free of charge. 
So for CYP56 encoding, the guidelines recommend for both ultra-rapid metabolizers and poor metabolizers that you avoid use of codeine because of the risk for toxicity and ultra-rapid metabolizers and, and the likelihood of having no um, uh, analgesic effect in poor metabolizers. They also state that tramadol should also be avoided and to a lesser extent hydrocodone and oxycodone. For normal metabolizers, of course, it's okay to use codeine in its normal um, age-appropriate recommended dose. For those who are intermediate metabolizers, the guidelines say so you can use recommended therapy, but if they have a poor analgesic response, then, then use an alternative agent. What we do at UF Health is we actually recommend alternative agents from the start for both poor and intermediate metabolizers, because intermediate metabolizers have such low amount of CYP2D6 activity. So we launched genotyping for CYP2D6 in July of 2015, so it's clinically available and can be ordered across our health system. And at the same time, we started two studies so that we could help determine whether this genotype-guided approach might be beneficial. One of those studies was done in patients with chronic pain, so pain for at least three months, and this was patients who were enrolled in primary care clinics here at UF Health and also a couple of clinics in Orlando. And then we have an ongoing tri uh, trial where patients are randomized to genotype-guided approach or to usual care for treatment of cancer-related pain in our oncology clinics. So we actually took coding off of our inpatient formulary here. This was done because of this risk for toxicity and ultra-rapid metabolizers, and we didn't have genotype yet available, so it was felt that it was best to avoid this drug. Um, however, we built clinical decision support so that if a physician prescribes tramadol, which is still on formulary, for a patient that has what we call an actionable genotype, so a genotype that would lead to a change in drug therapy, so this would be for poor, intermediate, or ultra-rapid metabolizers, then this, this alert will pop up warning the, the physician of either risk for toxicity or lack of analgesic response and recommending alternative therapy. So I mentioned the trial that we're, we did in primary care. We actually just recently completed this trial. We enrolled a total of 480 patients who were managed in primary care clinics with chronic pain of at least three months duration. And they were randomized in a two to one design to either a genotype intervention or to usual pain management. The uh, samples were collected for genetic analysis in both groups. In the genotype group, the genotype was returned in about a week and the result entered in the medical record. For the usual care group, we genotyped them at the end of the study. And all patients completed surveys at baseline in three months that assess pain intensity and other pain-related measures such as pain interference, physical functioning, and emotional functioning. And we use this through the NIH PROMISE measures. Our baseline pain score in the study population was 6.7 out of 10, so these patients had a pretty high burden of pain. What we found is that 10% of these patients were either poor and intermediate metabolizers by genotype, about 1% were ultra-rapid metabolizers. But if you took into account drug interactions, we know there are a number of drugs that inhibit the CYP2D6 enzyme, so if you take that into account, which can really kind of phenoconvert them to be a poor intermediate metabolizers, then overall 30% of the patients were either on an interacting drug or had a genotype that was associated with poor to intermediate metabolism. We have finished analyzing our data, and in terms of clinical implementation, we found that this approach was feasible to get the genetic sample and have the genotype result back within a week to help with drug therapy changes. Um, we also found that it would be more important if we could have the genotype available at the time the physician saw the patient. So they have that genotype there on hand, and therefore they can, they can change therapy as needed. The way we rolled it out, with the genotype coming back a week later, the patient may not return to the physician for several more months, and so the changes were not made until that latter visit, and they were actually only made about 31% of the time for individuals who had an actionable genotype. However, when changes were made, they strongly adhere to our recommendations. So they followed the recommendations by our team 97% of the time. So what happened is when the genotype came back for the genotype guided group, we had a clinical pharmacist who would write a consult note informing the physician of the genotype and any interacting medications that might decrease CYP2D6 activity and providing a recommendation for pain management. The effect of this approach on patient reported pain outcomes, particularly pain intensity, will be presented at the ASCPT meeting, the same one we're presenting the PPI um, results 
in March of this year. So just stay tuned for that. So while I can't share those data yet, I can share the experience of one patient. So this was a patient, Mr. Cruz, who was in our study and was randomized to the genotype guided arm. When he had a very high level of pain when he first started the study. He stated that all he really wanted to do on the weekends was spend time with his grandkids, but he was just in too much pain to really enjoy them. So he was genotype as part of the study, and based on his genotype and drug interactions, we recommended a change in therapy, which the physician did. And Mr. Cruz basically said, you cured me. He said that taking the test really changed his life. This is him at the park with his grandkids and that it's gonna change a lot of people's lives. So at least we know we have touched one person with this approach. So as I mentioned earlier, I lead the Ignite Pharmacogenetics Working Group, which is really an opportunity for sites across the country to share our experience with implementation, share data from this, which led to our outcome study with CYP2C19 testing and clopidogrel use. Um, and we're currently working on a, a analysis of CYP2D6 implementations across sites. Shown here are 16 sites in this working group and the various gene drug pairs they've implemented in clinical practice. The most common is CYP2C19 testing for clopidogrel, which is why that was the first example that we've studied. But you can see a number of sites have also offered CYP2D6 testing for codeine or tramadol. Um, they also may do testing related thiopurine dosing, selection of, of antidepressants, and even some testing for voriconazole, which is an anti-effective agent, which is metabolized through CYP2C19. So quite a, quite a lot of different implementations across this country, and there's a variety of those going on, and we expect this to only continue to expand. These are representative publications from our pharmacogenetics working group. Um, the first one shown at top was just an initial description of the, of the group and its opportunity for building evidence with pharmacogenetic implementation in this real world setting, so through a pragmatic trial design. The second I show here is our recent publications on, publication on outcomes with a genotype guided approach to antiplatelet therapy after coronary intervention. And then most recently, the group has published a paper on strategies of implementation of CYP2C19 testing to guide antiplatelet therapy, and that just came out, I believe, in either December or January. We have probably three other publications in the works. One of those includes a cost-effectiveness analysis of CYP2C19 testing to predict clopidogrel response. We have a website for the IGNITE network. This is actually run through UF and I provide the web link here if you'd like to visit that and learn more about what the different sites are doing. We also have a toolbox, so if you're thinking of implementing it in practice, you can look for tools that have been used at other sites, such as different clinical decision support tools, um, examples of different platforms used for genotyping and, and patient education materials and that kind of thing. So in summary, um, we the use of genetic information to guide decisions about drug therapy will likely continue to become increasingly common. Um, there is a need to generate evidence on outcomes with genotype guided therapy so that we can support sustainability, such as the outcomes data that I shared with CYP2C19 testing and clopidogrel. And a pharmacogenetics working group through IGNITE, as well as there are other pharmacogenetics working groups with other um, large networks, provide opportunities to um, collectively disseminate data on outcomes with pharmacogenetic testing. And then I'd just like to acknowledge the number of investigators who have contributed to the work that I presented today, as well as our funding sources. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Cavallari, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window. Type the question into the box that appears on the screen and click that Send button. So let's take a look at our first incoming questions currently coming in from our audience members. Our first question is, what additional data are needed to move the field forward? Okay, thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, I think a big part of it is to show that genotype-guided approaches can be beneficial for our patients. 
either by improving clinical outcomes or decreasing risk for adverse effects. Traditionally, when you're looking at um, these kind of data, what's generally considered the gold standard is a randomized controlled trial. However, I think conducting a randomized controlled trial for every example of genotype guided therapy would be quite expensive and labor intensive. There are a couple trials going on. For example, there are at least two trials looking at a CYP2C19 genotype guided approach to antiplatelet therapy. Those are expected to be completed in the next year or two. Um, but I think we have to look to other mechanisms for gathering this da data, such as the pragmatic type of studies that I presented today. So I think that you'll see going forward that there'll be more data coming out on outcomes with pharmacogenetic testing, and this may be what we really need to sustain this approach to prescribing and also to um, be able to secure reimbursement, which is another big obstacle going forward, able to um, obtain this from third-party payers for the genetic testing. Our next question, Dr. Cavallari, is what are the major lessons you have learned based on your experience with pharmacogenetics testing? Okay. Um, I think there are a couple of big lessons that we have learned. One is that there has to be some kind of clinical decision support to the physician. So just returning the genotype result back isn't necessarily going to help. We need some other assistance. So whether that is a clinical pharmacist, like we have had, who reviews the, the uh, genotype results and provides recommendations directly to the physician, um, either through a phone call or a consult note or however that's done, um, or building electronic clinical decision support, such as the best practice advisory that I showed. But overall, we found that it's just really important that without having clinical decision support, then it may not lead to appropriate changes based on genotype. I think another big lesson we've learned is how important it is to have the, the, the physician to have that genotype on hand when they're seeing the patient and not rather getting a sample and then having to wait a while for, this, for the genotype to come back. Um, and so we're, we're trying to think through approaches where we can be more preemptive. If we know a patient's coming to clinic, how can we get their genotype ahead of time so it's there with the physician when they're seeing the patient to act on rather than having to collect the sample then and wait another three months till the patient comes back uh, before they're able to act on those genotype results. So I think those are two of the big lessons that we've learned in our experience. Thank you very much. And I also want to thank our audience today for their wonderful questions coming in and I remind them that any questions not answered today will be answered via email. Our final question that we have time for today is, Dr. Cavallari, what do you see for the future of pharma, pharmacogenetics? I think this, this kind of gets back to what I was talking about with the lessons learned in that the genotyping needing to be available at the time that the, patient, the physician sees the patient. What I see as the future is that we may move toward a more preemptive genotyping approach, probably for a number of different genes and variants, not just a reactive approach we're doing now where we have a patient who comes in, they need a particular therapy, and so we're genotyping them and having to wait for the results to come back before we can apply that to their drug therapy decision. I think moving forward, we're going to see more places offering panel-based preemptive testing so that we could genotype individuals when they're still relatively healthy or there's not an urgent need for drug therapy, and then they'll have the genotype available in their medical record um, should they need any of the drugs that genotype could be important for. So that's where I see things moving toward. I think in a lot of ways this will be driven by patients, patients who may want this kind of information in their medical records to assist with their drug therapy. Um, a major challenge or barrier right now is there no, there's no reimbursement for this type of preemptive panel-based testing. But hopefully in the future we'll see this um, become more uh, commonplace because certainly it makes a lot of practical sense it also helps save a lot of cost because there's, it's very costly to have the personnel to rapidly turn genotype around and you have to have the luxury of banking samples from multiple patients and then running those at once. It's, it's a much less uh, costly endeavor. So this is where I see it going. They have currently going on in the UK, they have a clinical trial called the ubiquitous trial where they're testing this approach and they're doing this panel-based preemptive testing for their patients and then seeing how often that, that information is used to guide drug therapy 
and see whether or not it might lead to decreased risk for adverse effects um, and better outcomes in patients who have such data available. Thank you very much, Dr. Cavallari. And did you want to add any closing remarks before we close our webinar today? Um, I think just overall, this is pharmacogenetics is sort of the more actionable of the different genomic medicine initiatives that are going forward. We have a lot of data to support it. I think we'll see it being used in practice more and more. Um, there is some a controversy on the type of evidence that's needed to support pharmacogenetic implementation. There's one camp, and we fall into that here at UF Health, that says the genotype is really another laboratory test similar to measuring someone's kidney function that we do all the time without any randomized controlled trial data. It's really just another test to help us choose better therapy for the patient. There's another camp that really wants the randomized controlled trials to try to get results that show the genotype guided approach improves outcomes. Um, but I think going forward, we'll see more results coming out from pragmatic studies who have already implemented into testing. Um, this data will be important to support sustainability of the field. Um, and uh, I think maybe eventually this pharmacogenomics can pave the way for other gene-based um, interventions to occur, including greater use of genetic information for disease risk or um, predicting disease phenotype and even assisting in disease diagnosis. Dr. Cavallari, thank you again for your presentation and for your important research. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available on demand through May 2018. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that this webcast will be available for replay. Please share the announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's it for now, and thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.